This is episode number 17 with Robert Goldsby. Coming up. We had a British nurse who had been the prisoner of the Japanese for four years, and she was a redhead, and she appeared on stage in a white slip, and the men nearly went out of their minds with suggestions of underwear underneath it, and、uh, they nearly went nuts. And the guy punches the baby. And the audience screams with laughter, and then the, out of the carriage shoots a stream of water and hits the guy right in the face. The great actors all could just make those changes uh, uh, so clear. And、uh, there was, the better the actor, the more transitions there were,、uh, and the more clarity there was in what they each meant and how they reflected the intentions or the objectives of the character.、Uh, why does he, he love Sally Men? He says, I don't know why. A reason is not what governs love. La raison n'est pas ce qui règle l'amour. Hey there, my name is Nathan Agan, and this is the Working Actors Journey, bringing you in depth conversations with actors that have been working professionally for decades. Hope you're doing well out there. We continue season two today, and if you're just joining us, we have a number of fantastic episodes where working actors share where they've been, how they do it, and what they've learned along the way. Actors who have been putting in the work day in, day out, and who have certainly had their ups and downs like everyone else. These conversations are meant to inspire and reassure you on your journey. That you're not alone, you're not crazy, and though the road may be long and challenging, there are rewards ahead. And I really want to help you as an actor out there. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss anything ahead and visit the website workingactorsjourney.com where you can get a copy of the guide 12 Top Acting Tips from Season 1. These are some of the best ideas taken from all the episodes compiled in one place. And it's waiting for you. There's also a link in the episode description. Today on the show is Robert Goldsby, a man of the theater for over 60 years. He's worked as an actor, director, professor, administrator, producer, translator, master teacher, scholar, and author. He directed over 150 equity and university theater productions in both the U.S. and France. Robert was on the faculty of Columbia, ACT, and USC, and is chairman emeritus for UC Berkeley's Department for Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies. Now, yes, Robert, even by his own admission, worked more as a director than an actor, though I knew he'd be a wonderful guest on this show for a few reasons. He spent his life in the theater wearing many different hats. He was married for decades to the amazing actress Angela Payton. He wrote a book about the performance of Moliere's plays, and after 60 plus years, he is a wealth of information. I'm truly honored that for his first podcast interview, he's part of the working actor's journey. Now, when you talk about back in the day, Robert is the guy. Just listen to this. Acting in the war and studied in Paris during the 40s. Resident director of the Columbia Players and at UC Berkeley in the 50s. Resident director and setting up the conservatory program at ACT in the 60s. Founded Berkeley Stage Company and chairman of UC Berkeley's theater department in the 70s. Directing at regional theaters in the 80s. Head of the MFA directing program at USC in the 90s, continuing to direct and wrote his book on Moliere in the 2000s. Just wow. And of course, he did many other things during those years, along with acting roles along the way, including as Mark Twain and even scenes opposite Robert Redford and Natalie Wood in the film The Candidate. It was actually a former guest that helped make this interview happen. Gigi Birmingham from episode number 10 is married to Robert's son, Matt. I knew both her and Matt from the Intias Company in LA and certainly knew of Robert and Angela, who were around from time to time. 
The closest that Robert and Angela and I ever got to working together is that we were part of different one acts for a production of Noel Coward's Tonight at 8:30, and I honestly still remember how much I enjoyed the piece he directed and that Angela was in. And while I knew Robert had a long career, it wasn't until I prepped for this interview and then talked with him that I really got a better sense of all he's done. There is just so much, and he has a wealth of information to share. Like that old saying, he's probably forgotten more than many of us will ever know. Now, of course, I wish I could have also chatted with his wife Angela Payton, who passed away a few years ago. Though I'm very happy Robert is here to share his story. So, in today's episode, Robert and I cover working with Walter Matthau and getting pinched by him, the importance of studying both literature and performance, why directors need to really understand the text. His introduction to the very alive work of Molière, creating the curriculum for the ACT program, which is still used, why plays were so thrilling when he was teaching, what student actors had that professionals did not, and a whole lot more. Having great mentors and access to outstanding teachers can make the difference in your career. And that's what this show is hoping to do—to connect you with actors that could change your life and make your acting journey easier and more satisfying. And if you'd like to get exclusive access to additional episodes, bonus content, and items that are available nowhere else, I invite you to become a premium member of the Working Actors Journey, starting at just two dollars per month at WorkingActorsJourney.com/premium. Just to give you an idea of benefits, I recently sent out an exclusive bonus episode with Robert Pine from episode number one. Members learned more about what he looks for in a script, and also how the current state of business, including with services like Netflix, is affecting the middle class performer. More great insights into the life of a working actor, and they also got to know before anyone else who today's guest was. So, if those kinds of insider scoops and bonus content are up your alley, become a premium member. Again, just two dollars per month to get started. Plus, by joining, you're ensuring that this show continues. Consider this the most inexpensive and possibly most valuable acting class you'll ever take. Join now at WorkingActorsJourney.com/premium, or see the show notes and episode description for a link. Now, in addition to what I mentioned before, here's a bit more about Robert Goldsby's journey. He earned a B.A. in French and Comparative Literature from Columbia, and along with directing studies, an M.F.A. in Acting from Yale. For thirty years, he was professor of acting, dramatic literature, and directing at the University of California at Berkeley, and he ultimately served as chair of this department. Robert was a founding director of the Berkeley Stage Company, which introduced many new plays and playwrights to America. He has translated works by Sardou, Molière, and Fado. Of the 150-plus productions he directed, there were 11 plays by Molière, 46 classical plays from Aristophanes to Shakespeare to Giraudot, and 98 plays from the modern repertory from Ibsen to Inarato. As both director and scholar, Robert has been particularly devoted to Molière. He published a book from his lifetime of experience and research titled "Molière on Stage: What's So Funny." Are you looking for more info from industry insiders and great teachers about being an actor? And do you want this as something you can listen to on the go? Well, you're in luck. As a listener of the Working Actors Journey podcast, Audible is offering you a free audiobook and a free 30-day trial. Whether it's one hour or 15 hours, it doesn't matter. Whatever you want, that first item is totally free. To download your audiobook today, go to workingactorsjourney.com/audible. Here are a few recommendations for your acting journey. The Actor's Life by Jenna Fisher. From the office, read by the author and others, including our guest Reed Burney. Secrets of Screen Acting by Patrick Tucker, 
a TV and film director, read by David Lawrence the Seventeenth. Respect for Acting by Uta Hagen, read by Angel Masters. Get one of these or anything else at workingactorsjourney.com slash audible. Robert really has had such a full and amazing career in life. I'm so thrilled to share this chat with you, and I know you'll enjoy hearing his thoughts, ideas, and all about his journey. Talking with someone with this much life experience is always exciting. They've seen, done, and been through quite a bit, and I learn so much just by listening. One of the most amazing things that's been part of this experience is that Robert mailed, as in yes, physically mailed me, a copy of his resume. It details what happened every year of his professional career. It's nine pages long and filled with so much, from 1944 with the U.S. Army all the way to directing memorials for his wife, Angela Payton, in 2016. That's over 70 years of work. It's actually inspired me to see if I can create a version for myself to write down what I've accomplished each year. It seems like such a cool way to go through your history rather than lumping giant things together to really break it down and see how much one has truly accomplished. I'm planning to scan and post at least sections of Robert's resume online, so keep an eye out for that. Robert and I had a wonderful chat full of passion, enthusiasm, and many lessons on life as a working creative. Make sure you stick around for the very end of the conversation. He shares a few of his favorite quotes from plays, and I just love how he connects these to where he's at. So here we go with episode number 17, Please enjoy my chat with Robert Goldsby. Are you uh, are you someone that uh, likes to spend your days reading, or uh, what now occupies your mind? Oh well, I am walking my wonderful Siberian Husky oh, three wow. times a day, and that takes a half hour each time. And then I'm trying to keep up. I haven't paid attention to the news since Joseph McCarthy, but <laughs> I'm paying attention to news now, both the New York Times and television coverage. And I'm reading um, several books. I just finished Chateaubriand's Memoirs from Beyond the Tomb, which was an incredible book. Um, and uh, now I'm reading a little bestseller called Asymmetry okay. and about a young girl who lives with, I think, Philip Roth <laughs> or oh, wow. a fictional, fictional counterpart of Philip Roth when he's an old sure. man. Sure. So uh, I read and I watch TV and I go to dinner with 200 old people and uh, <laughs> I walk the dog and uh, look out the window and that's about it. Well, Robert, I like how you said that, that you go to dinner with old people because you, of course, yourself are not old. It's always everybody oh, no, else I'm is not old. old. I'm just 91. <laughs> you know. Um, and, you know, you mentioned your, your wife, Angie, and, and I was uh, I feel fortunate that I, I did, you know, meet her on a couple of occasions and at least, you know, see her work. Yeah. At Antia. So both of you guys were always just very, very sweet and a um, lot of a lot of talent between the two of you. Yeah, she was a, uh, she and Jerry Page were the best actresses I ever knew. Hmm. Wow. I was just thinking of Jerry Page and I saw her at the actor studio where I spent a year. And she did a scene from Macbeth when uh, he goes off to murder the king and she stands there listening and mm -hmm. she just heard every sound of New York that came in the doors and a major hair stand on end. And wow. it was just astonishing. Uh, I've never seen anything like that. Very cool. Uh, a very good lesson on the importance of listening when you're an actor. Uh, she was uncanny. And she did the greatest Williams I ever saw, Summer in Smoke. Really? Wow. Phenomenal, phenomenal performance of, uh, I think Joe Anthony directed it, and he said, Jerry, don't just do something, just stand there, because she was a Liberty gibbet actress. She did 5,000 transitions per minute, and um, each one clearly different from the other. But she was uncanny. Wow. Great, great work, yeah. 
Well, you mentioned. Okay, so what can I tell you? <laughs> well, you mentioned New York. Um, you know, uh, going to the actor studio, but that's where you were born, right? I was born in Brooklyn, yeah, but I grew okay. up in New Jersey. Okay, and um, so this was during the Depression, or uh, or was it nineteen the twenties? I was born in nineteen twenty-six. Okay, and so right. the Depression came right after that, and my okay. father, in the middle of the Depression, moved to Elizabeth and took over a little mortgage company and uh, he built that up into a sizable operation. Oh, really? And we lived in Maplewood, New Jersey. Okay. I, I did two plays in my early years. One was I was in fifth grade and I did an Indian beggar sitting on the stage with just a loincloth. And I had to walk up this corridor to get to the theater uh, half naked. And it was so embarrassing. <laughs> And then I got on stage and it wasn't, and it was f fine. And I felt very comfortable. So that was amazing. And then in high school, high junior high school, I played Scrooge and I was sitting backstage waiting to go on. And I felt this wave of, this is where I belong. And I never forgot that either. So those were two, my two first theater experiences uh, in uh, school. And then I went off to the army where I toured the Philippines and Three Men on a Horse uh, that Walter Matthau played in New York. <laughs> wow. Well, okay. So growing up, did you, you, you know, did you have a lot of other actors that you admired or, or the radio plays that were really capturing your imagination and your creativity? Oh, sure. Your... I, I listened faithfully to The Lone Ranger. Mm -hmm. And of course, we used to hang out at the radio for Major Bowes, Amateur Hour and stuff like that. I listened to the radio a lot, you know. And so, you know, I mean, it sounds like once you got into high school, you know, you felt with the Scrooge performances, you were saying that this is where you belonged. But did yeah. you have other dreams or ideas as a kid of what you wanted to be? No, I really didn't. I had no idea. And I, when I was in the Army, I toured this play and I found out what comedy was about because we had a British nurse who had been the prisoner of the Japanese for four years. And she was a redhead, and she appeared on stage in a white slip. And the men nearly went out of their minds to see this <laughs> woman in a slip with suggestions of underwear underneath it. And uh, they nearly went nuts. And we got played that play around uh, everywhere. And in one instance, we played for a division way out in the boondocks. And they had missed the scheduled rotation home. And they were sitting out there and there wasn't a laugh in the show. And that was a terrible moment <laughs> <laughs> because usually we were ground out with laughter. It's a very funny play. Of course. So, so how did you get um, involved in doing this play in the army? I don't know. I got cast. They had an open casting for professional actors and, and I went and for some reason I got cast. So, um, <laughs> and my buddy got polio in it and uh, I didn't. Oh, but it wow. was a way of learning about how comedy works, especially sex. Um, and uh, the appearance of that woman was astonishing. She she was just a, a plain woman. You know, she wasn't very glamorous, but she was white and she was in a slip. And that was all she needed to set the whole place afire. Once we were rained out because the rain hit the roof and we were in a concert hut and we were drowned out by the rain. Uh, or we had to cancel the performance because they couldn't hear anything. Right. <laughs> it was that loud. Well, I, I can imagine if if you had just brought the woman out on stage, that might have made everything worthwhile. They they yeah. probably didn't need to hear anything at that point. No, no we might as well have stopped the play. <laughs> um, so it sounds like there were ideas that you picked up as a performer and probably later as a director you know, from that experience? Because how long were you touring that show in the Army? We toured it, uh, I think, almost six months. Uh, with wow. Baguio and all around the Philippines. And uh, uh, when we got back, I went into the hospital with some mysterious fever. And uh, I went in the ward where people were uh, yelling and whatever, trying to get out of the Army. And... Uh, it was a, a awesome experience. Hmm. And I later went, met Walter Matthau in the couch strip. I was in a film with Walter Matthau. And um, I told him about, he had been in it in New York. 
And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, he laughed. And and then when we did our scene, I was so uptight, he pinched me on the ass. <laughs> I jumped and then I was able to do the scene. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to get rid of my uh, tension and he did. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was a great character. Yeah. Well, anyway, uh, I, my life took two, two real paths uh, out of that because I went to Columbia mm -hmm. where I majored in comparative literature and uh, took the famous core course in great books and um, appeared in the Columbia Players about seven times. Oh, wow. And then uh, so I majored in comparative literature and uh, then I went to Yale and took an MFA in acting. So. I had two major interests. One was in literature and one was in a performance. And I took that dual experience when I was appointed to Berkeley. And we made a department out of that idea of studying literature and theater performance. Uh, wow. And it went from AB through PhD uh, eventually. Hmm. So the two ideas of studying uh, plays and also uh, being aware of performance values and techniques and stuff. Uh, it meant it's the same program that they used in the Polish National School of Theater. They uh, forced the students to read and study plays and uh, then also to learn the techniques of, of acting or directing. Wow. We had the same kind of program. Usually that doesn't happen. That Most of the conservatories don't teach literature at all. Right. And most of the listeners don't teach performance. So uh, we did both. Well, so I have a, a couple questions. One, I'm curious where your, you know, interest or fascination with the literature began and and also why you think it's so important to have both of those disciplines together. Well, uh, I, I think it began from reading. I read very early. I read before I went to school, Tarzan of the Apes. and. Um, I was always vulnerable to uh, novels and stories. I didn't know much about plays except for those two little bits I did. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, well, I think that uh, as a director, you have to understand the text. And um, a lot of directors don't understand the text. And then they don't understand the techniques of directing either. Uh, they just think it's all feeling. And uh, uh, I learned the old fashioned way of uh, studying techniques of composition and, and blocking and stuff like that. And um, and also the study of a, the play to try to understand what it was all about. Uh, sure. And then then you try to figure out how to show the audience what it's all about. Uh, and that's the trick of directing, isn't it? Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. I mainly was a director. I did acting early in my career, but and off and on all through it. But um, I wasn't all that great at it. Um, I, I wasn't. I did some things pretty well, but uh, I was basically a, a director. What do you feel you excelled at as an actor? Oh boy, uh, the best parts I ever played was uh, Witch Boy and Dark of the Moon. Oh, I did Harmfulness of Tobacco, which was fabulous, from Chekhov. Hmm. Uh, those two stand out. And they're both very eccentric and uh, uh, melodramatic in a sense. I liked uh, extreme uh, behavior mm -hmm. because I didn't live that way. So I could do that when I was acting, and that was fun. Yeah, I was actually you know, curious about your, your parents. And I know you said your dad took on that company and, and made it in something bigger, but was it a pretty kind of quiet home life? Uh, you know, What did your mom do? Oh, yeah. My mom and dad were both from the South. Uh, she was a Southern belle her whole life. She never got past 29, but she actually lived to 80. Uh, and my father was a very gentle, very quiet uh lawyer he was grew up in mississippi and uh, went in the army in world war one and then uh was uh, went to columbia law school and worked for a big company in new york and then transferred out to elizabeth to make his fortune and he did they were both very quiet and as a matter of fact uh i grew up with a, a negro servant in the house i can't believe this actually happened but it did uh, she came with my mother when they moved north. Uh, she had worked for my grandmother and, uh, she lived in our house 
and actually brought me up. Uh, and it didn't occur to me till later that it was extraordinarily uh, reminiscent of Southern slavery because she lived with us and her husband lived up the street. Uh, wow. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah I, I mean, when I grew up, I couldn't believe that that was how we lived, but we did. And uh, she and my mother were extremely close. And uh, well, there you go. That's the remnant of the old society, the old world. Sure. And it was still my upbringing. Uh, right. I was very liberal about all that. And uh, uh, my daughter married a black man. So, uh, you know, it wasn't in my heritage to think like that, but it was theirs. Yeah. It, it, was, a, it was a different time in, in, in many, many oh, yeah. ways. Yeah, of course. In many yeah. ways, right. And, and do you ha- uh, did you have any uh, brothers and sisters growing up? Yeah, I have a, one sister, and she paints, and uh, she lives in New England and uh, Providence. Nobody in my family did theater. Okay. And all three of my children did theater when we had our own theater, Berkeley Stage, and uh, they all appeared as actors, but they all decided they wanted to make a living, and they did other things. <laughs> they were all scientists, a lawyer, a doctor, and a chemist. <laughs> oh, Wow. Well, I wanted to ask, uh, I know when you were in college, you spent some time in Paris. And, you know, what was the motivation to go there? Well, I just wanted to go to Europe. I had served three years in the Philippines, and I was at Columbia, and I wanted to go to Europe. And Paris was the most glamorous place I knew of. So I got uh, accepted in the junior year program, and I went to Paris. And in Paris, I lived with the older lady from the Comédie Française, who was a Swiss pensionnaire. So I learned about theater in the bedroom. <laughs> she was a phenomenal actress with the Comédie. She was the only Swiss ever to be in the Comédie Française. And uh, she took me there for many uh, Molière plays. And uh, she had played in Femme Savante. And um, she took me to the opening of The Misanthrope with the hero of the Resistance. Um, who came back on stage as Alceste, and the place went wild for five minutes of yelling. And the poor actor stood there downstage center, and his tears started rolling down his face. And then when he started to talk, he lost his voice. <laughs> wow. So that's when I found out that Molière was an emotional writer for the French, not a, a dead, lousy, everyman translation of the plays. Uh, he was alive and he was phenomenal. And I, that started my whole career working. I did 11 of Moliere's plays and I wrote a book about him. Yeah, I, I, w- I would love to kind of, you know, unpack that and explore that a little bit more because, yeah, I think uh, Moliere, like maybe some other playwrights, maybe they just they feel heavy or they, they feel or, or sound dated or, or something, you know, you know they, yeah, they don't right. feel as... Uh, alive or uh, relevant, uh, maybe then, uh, you know, w- w- compared to what you would say, contemporary plays or things being written now. Yeah, right. And as a matter of fact, they're, more, they're intensely alive if you find the right way to get at them. I mean, he is. Right. Uh, well, I, so I'd love to hear, what do you feel actors need to know when they're working on Moliere? Are, 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 there, are there different you know, things to keep in mind. I mean, of course, when you're talking about Shakespeare, there people talk about, oh, the clues he left in the writing and all that kind of stuff and yeah. the, the folio training you can do. But, you know, as an actor approaching Moliere uh, specifically, are there things that can really help an actor unlock stuff? Yeah, one is my book. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Moliere on Stage or What's So Funny? And it's, uh, it's really uh, an attempt to put on paper what I learned in 60 years of directing his plays um, Mm -hmm. and what I learned from living with Nadine, who is is one of his great practitioners. And uh, it's mostly a life story that we know a lot about. uh, And we don't know anything about Shakespeare's really. Right. But we do know a lot about Moliere's life and his, uh, and his growing up and his performances and his company and, his relation to Louis the Fourteenth and all that stuff, and it was all intensely emotional and sexual and uh, intensely alive uh, performances, and also as a genius at comedy. I mean, he uh, is the first great comic writer since Aristophanes, 
and there weren't anybody in between really. I mean, there are some Romans that worked out a little bit, but uh, nothing like what Aristophanes did or Moliere, uh, who wrote all kinds of new forms of comedy. And um, he's intensely personal to me. I mean, I, you know, I can uh, feel his life in the words. And I think that's where you have to go is to his life and his his love of um, Madeline and uh, his wife of, that grew up as a child of his. I mean, they all said he was married his own daughter. Uh, presumably he didn't, but uh, he must have known, and Madeline must have known, who was the father of his wife. But um, he brought her up as his daughter, and then he married her. So, you know, that that, that kind of extraordinary uh, emotional life of a man that was beset by love and couldn't stand not having it returned is the basis of a lot of the plays, even the mm-hmm. Parsis, even, a, a, you know, he wrote a magnificent verse play, The Misanthrope, which took him two years to write. And uh, then after that was over, he did Doctor in Spite of Himself, which opens with a farcical man beating a woman, socking her around the stage, and she's yelling and screaming, and he's saying, you love it, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's a it's an extraordinary farcical scene after the misanthrope, you know, right. and he comes right on top of it. Uh, so any man that can do those extremes of uh, a great literary masterpiece and a, and a French farce, which is as funny today as it was in 1680, you know, uh, it's, just, it's amazing to me. Um, and I did a wonderful play of his called uh, Fourier de Scapin. I did at Berkeley in a translation by Lady Gregory in an Irish brogue. And that's the most alive translation I ever worked on. Wow. Uh, it was an Irish lilting language and Lady Gregory had just nailed it. Um, a wonderful work yeah, in English. So I've always been involved. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, well, so maybe you could help, also help um, d- dispel maybe a, a myth, uh, for example, you know, with with Moliere and and other you know classical playwrights, a lot of times they get ascribed uh, a certain style of how to play them and how to act them, and and I feel like the more I learn or try to understand about these plays, you know, I, I'm I'm not really sure that that is the correct approach. And I would just love to hear your thoughts on you know, is there a style to doing Moliere? Is there a you know, I mean, it's not Commedia dell'arte, which, you know, is kind of more of a style of theater. But uh, what are your thoughts on, on like, is there a quote unquote way to act Moliere plays? No, I think the way to act him is to read like the Wilbur translations are graceful and, and uh, skillful. I'm sorry we lost with Richard Wilbur this year. He died. He was a. Mm a great uh, helper to Moliere's work in the theater of today. Uh, so I, well, I always just started with the words and I do readings and slow readings and fast readings and study readings and, uh, and slowly uh, put it on the stage and see what happens. Uh, I didn't impose a style on the actors. Uh, we found it, in saying the words and understanding the diction and doing s- slow reading, for instance, I learned from Jean Lenoir, where you take a text like a Moliere text and you say it word by word and you put a little caesura in between each word so that the word has a chance to sink into your head and what it means. Uh, mm. You don't interpret it. You just say it and think about it. And, uh, it's an amazing technique, especially with professional actors who start knowing already how to do it, you know. And right. So they do what they've done before instead of letting this thing create something in them that's uh, connected to the uh, essential meaning of the word. And that way the style develops out of firsthand knowledge of the meaning that he put into the words, you know, and... Uh, so your style is quite different if you're doing the misanthrope or you're doing the doctor in spite of himself. I mean, one is a broad farce and you're playing like Moliere burlesque people. I once saw a burlesque show where the guy is taking care of a baby on the stage, right? And he rocks hmm. the baby. And then uh, a stripper comes by and does a bump and grind at him. 
and he wants to go to the stripper, but she disappears. And then another one comes out and they repeat that three or four times. And then the headliner comes out and just she saws a curtain and the guy punches the baby and the audience screams with laughter. And then the, out of the carriage shoots a stream of water and hits the guy right in the face. That's broadest possible, you know, farce of the unacceptable, the unknowable, the undoable. <laughs> the worst thing you can do is hit a baby. Right. And the farce makes it funny because the baby is indestructible, you know, and not going to be hurt in the theater. Right. So I think it's the text. Um, you're paying attention to the text and uh, working on it carefully to understand what it's about, what it means, what the intentions are, all that method stuff, which I used all the time, too. Um, sure. So I, I think it's not an, a style that you can uh, say, well, if you do this, you'll be able to play it. Right. You have to watch out for your feet and where your legs are and what your positions are. But you should be able to do that without thinking you should get that in school. Right. They don't right. always teach that anymore, but but you should know how to stand on stage in an open position and and the difference between standing full front down center and facing up stage up left, you know. There right. you have a different uh, uh, strength in either position. So you have to know those things as an actor too, so you don't let yourself uh, get into weak positions when you need to be strong, uh, that kind of thing. And that's right. very important in classical stuff because you really have to understand the words. The same thing is true of Shakespeare. In other words, you, you have to know what the words mean and most of them mm -hmm. have changed. So you have to have a, you have to study it. You know, you can't just wing it. You, you have to think about it and then you have to let go of the thinking and let yourself feel it. Right. You know, it's a it's a fascinating thing, classical plays, and I've done eighty of them. So wow. yeah, I started going over this resume, and I thought, well, I can't just talk about. It. And then I did uh, <laughs> this, and then I did that. Uh, I looked at this uh, thing, and in one year, I did Phaedra, of Lowell, Robert Lowell's translation of Racine, Ghosts, and King Lear. I mean, that was the same year. Wow! So that was a real workout, wasn't it? <laughs> And and I spent a year on Aristophanes, the birds, which we did in the Greek theater for 3000 people a night. And uh, my wife played the goddess at the end of it. <laughs> so you say, I mean, no, it all sounds like such cool stuff. And I, and I, I just feel like I need to comment. It's so exciting to hear how still so passionate you are about all these topics. It's, it's really fun to, to chat with you about this because, oh, you know, yeah. all of, all of this energy is still in you about, you know, th these thoughts on theater and, 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 uh, it's great. Um, what I, what I wanted to ask is you, you know, we're mentioning some of these plays and you did so much classical theater. How did you decide what plays to do? What were your kind of criteria in terms of, you know, picking, you know, uh, plays to work on or, or text to explore, that kind of stuff? Well, um, some plays I was just asked to direct. Um, like I did Bleak House at South Coast and they had decided to do that play and I had five actors in 30 roles. Wow. Uh, other other um, choices came from a thematic decision by the chairman of my department at Berkeley to do, for example, um, four major checkoff plays in a year. And I did the cherry hmm. orchard. And then we also did a season of Shakespeare, which I ended up the season doing the Tempest. So uh, play choice is very important. Uh, sometimes there are thematic programmatic, uh, decisions by the group of, um, people in the theater, and sometimes, very often, they're personal. For instance, we had a theater that did new plays, and we screened about 800 new plays a year, and we ended up doing five of them in major productions. So those five were personal choices. And I, for instance, was always uh, looking for something that felt extremely alive, like Albert Inarato's play, Earthworms or Wisdom and Muck, he was a New York playwright that did Gemini mm -hmm. right. and brought mm -hmm. for five years. And uh, I met Joe Papp and I loved his play Earthworms and um, Papp had the rights to it. So I went to see him and he gave me the rights and Albert came out and 
My wife played Edith, who was an extraordinary old, old bag lady who crawled around the floor killing cockroaches and saying, gotcha. <laughs> so that was a personal choice because he felt intensely alive to me. Mm-hmm. Um, poor Albert, he self-destructed, but um, uh, he, he had that gift of uh, infusing a word with uh, real life and real energy. And uh, you just had to tap into that. It was extraordinary. So I looked for that, you know, in in plays I was going to do. I looked for that in uh, great writers like Ibsen, where you, every line means four different things. Uh, and it's extraordinary complex and also intensely alive today, if you get the right words. He's dated by lousy translations a lot, but... Um, I was fortunate. I did Ghost, for instance, with a student actor who knew Norwegian, and we kind of oh, went through it very slowly and carefully, and we got words that were very close to the Norwegian. And the play felt absolutely alive, and my neighbor told me he thought it was a new play. Wow. Um, uh, so, uh, and we didn't do it realistically, like in a, a well-made play set, you know. We did it in a surreal set, and... Uh, uh, it was a uh, staircase floating out of the black and uh, all, all kinds of little touches that uh, felt like a nightmare, you know. Sure. And the play was extraordinarily alive. And when I saw it even done by uh, Uma Thurman, I think it was, it was in a fourth wall set. It was boring looking and uh, they couldn't get out of the set. They just were prisoner of that old fashioned mm. um, fourth wall, you know, door up center set. Um, right. Uh, thing and uh, so you look for the what makes the play uh, live and breathe for you and it, it, they're, those plays are intensely personal to the writers um, you know and then when they do them they're imagining something that's uh, uh, very vivid to them and um, you just have to get back in their head and try to find another vividness that's uh, truthful to the original. I'm, I'm all for the playwright, you know, the playwright is where you go to study. I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of concept directing and, mm-hmm. and making, doing a play that's supposed to be au courant or uh, bringing up Trump or something. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm more of a favorite of doing a play in period, but uh, doing it with some kind of um, non-formula approach, right? You know, Sure, sure. Well, you mentioned, um, you know, translating works, and, and I know you, you, you did that, you and your wife Angie, um, tra- yeah. French plays. Uh, actually, I, I remember telling you that I was working on, it was probably Sardou, and, you know, happened to flip to the front of the text, and all of a sudden I see names I, <laughs> I know, I recognize it. It's like, wait a second, yeah. I, I, I know the people who translated this, like, you know, 40 or 50 years ago. That's um, right. We did it together. It, we did it in a car riding across the country from New York <laughs> to Berkeley, throwing lines back and forth. Uh, we did it for Eric Bentley on Hill and Wang series. Yeah. Let's get a well, divorce. And so I'm, I'm curious how that came about and, and what, what fascinated or, or interested you guys in, in doing translating work? Well, uh, what interested us was that Eric Bentley asked us to do it. <laughs> sure, yeah. I worked for Eric Bentley in, in Columbia as his assistant, and uh, okay, we wow. got to know each other pretty well. And uh, so he he got this contract to do 19th century plays, and so he picked me uh, to do the Sardou, and that was in uh, Let's Get a Divorce in Other Plays, the book. And that play was done in London with uh, an actress named Fenella Fielding and played on the West End for nine months wow. at the comedy theater. So it was, and it was done all over the place for a while. And Sardou was a very skillful, you know, he's sort of like Neil Simon who just passed. Right. Uh, yeah. he, he wrote these skillful little domestic plays uh, that big actors always took on, like uh, Eleonora Duza played in uh, uh, Divorce. Hmm. Um, so, you know, it was, um, he was a very a skillful boulevard playwright, but not a great artist, no. Yeah. Well, so uh, you mentioned Eric Bentley. I mean, that must have been a, an amazing connection to have early on in your career. And er- Eric is over a hundred and still with us and, you know, yeah. had a long career himself, but that, that must have been a very, 
or I would imagine it was a very uh, important relationship early on in your in your development as a creative well, person. At Columbia, I had uh, uh, three extraordinary teachers in the drama. They were all lecturers uh, who talked about the modern theater. One was Joseph Wood Crouch, who was a very famous um, critic of modern drama. The other was Maurice Valenci, who had a play on Broadway. And the third was Eric Bentley that I uh, taught, took his course. And then later I was hired as his assistant to grade papers and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. So Eric knew me because I also directed plays for the Columbia players and he went to them. Uh, oh, okay. And he, he liked me, my work as a director. Yeah. You know, he got me the job at Berkeley as a matter of fact, you know. Well, that must have meant a lot that he enjoyed your work because he was also writing, you know, he was a theater critic, uh, you know, he was oh, doing he that was professionally. <laughs> writer, yeah, yeah he, he was a very fine critic. Uh, I should call him. I'm scared to call him because I don't think he'll be there. But I guess he's still with us, huh? He's he's oh yeah he's over a hundred and and maybe he's walking his Siberian husky. Who knows? Yeah yeah I I went to his ninetieth birthday in New York and he had everybody in New York there. That was fun. Oh that that must have been amazing to see everybody yeah, again. He, he's an awesome guy. Well, great. Um, I wanted to jump to uh, or or at least talk about. I guess um, you were at the early days of uh, ACT in San Francisco. And yeah. uh, I would love to hear what was your focus or what was the idea at the time in terms of what you wanted to teach actors or what you wanted to, you know, or, or what was the, the genesis? Because I know it was all very new at that point. Well, um, I was invited to join the company when they moved to San Francisco. Uh, Bill Ball wanted my wife, Angie, to come and join the company as an actress uh, and he wanted her to play Long Day's Journey. Oh, okay. And so well. he, he hired both of us, and I think I was hired in order to get her. <laughs> uh, and I was hired as an assistant director, and I eventually ended up developing the first summer congress of the mm -hmm. conservatory. And, um, and we planned the curriculum uh, for the year program, which is still working uh, under various other directors. I left after three years, uh, but I started it all. Mm. And uh, I think basically the method was, um, you know, Stanislavski's chart has two, uh, the self is at the bottom, the actor's personal self. And then there's two sides to the structure. One is inner technique and that includes things like intention and units and objectives and emotional stuff, right? And mm -hmm. the other side, which is almost always not mentioned, is the outer technique. And it includes things like ways of walking and diction and a study of uh, structures and stuff like that. So Stanislavski had half of his method was external and um, not inner personal. Uh, motivation, like uh, if I were Hamlet, I would do this or that, you know. Right. Um, so the ACT curriculum tried to do both. We taught principles of the method, you know, all the famous directions of Stanislavski about uh, units and objectives and intent and transitions and just discerning transitions and intentional discoveries uh, and all that stuff. And also Michael Chekhov's wonderful, wonderful book on imaginary centers called To the Actor mm -hmm. and uh, Stanislavski's chart, which had both inner and outer techniques to study and break down. And then, of course, we did a lot of voice and speech work. Uh, and uh, we also did a famous technique uh, called the Alexander Technique, which was a sure. physical technique of... Uh, also, very connected to Chekhov's centers. You worked on the spine and the knees forward and away and back level and, and broad and, you know, things that the Alexander developed as a technique to help actors with tension and also to produce strong voices and stuff. So we did all those. Uh, and he had, we did things like uh, uh, stilts and walking on stilts and uh, uh, balancing and juggling and 
circus techniques. There was somebody on the staff that taught circus techniques. Uh, so it was a very uh, eclectic program that spanned both the traditional method investigation of personal involvement and personal investment of yourself in the role, but also uh, ways of walking. How would you walk and how would you gesture and what would you do with your hands and all that kind of stuff. So um, it was a very fascinating uh, mixture of inner and outer techniques that we did at ACT. That's what I did. Uh, that's what we started. Well, as a director, I uh, I always had a procedure, whether it was stock or classical, of trying to read the play four or five times and trying to uh, locate difficult points in it. Like, suppose you're doing Don Juan and you've got to figure out how to take him down into hell at the end. So sure. your ground plan is the essential choice that you make as a director, that and casting are the two pivotal decisions. And you make a ground plan out of studying uh, through reading uh, what the text asks you to account for. So you have to figure out where things are going to be on the stage and then uh, figure out a ground plan that will accommodate those things. You know, if you're doing ghosts, you have to have a sofa that has a soft velour kind of soft and crimson like uh, <laughs> like syphilis and uh, you have to work with concepts like polarity or a famous book about Shakespeare calls what happens in Hamlet you have to know what happens in a play and then you have to work to discover how to implement that what happens to your ground plan and make sure all that's in place before you start rehearsals because if you make a mistake in the ground plan, you can't change it very well uh, later on. So you right. have to be careful to get the right ground plan and know where things are and how to solve the major uh, uh, scenes, for instance, like the polarity, the beginning and ending. And uh, what, what does that mean? And what happens in the middle? <laughs> so right. one of the most ex fascinating things I ever learned was from Jean Renoir, who is the son of the great painter. And Jean Renoir was the director of uh, two of the top 10 movies of all time. One was Grand Illusion and Rules of the Game. And he came to Berkeley and we sat around at a table for four months translating his play. Hmm. And then we worked on together as a director. He didn't know that much about directing theater. Uh, so I worked with him on the, uh, getting it on stage. But he had a technique he called Rehearsal à l'Italienne in which you take a play, the text, and you say the word uh, slowly, and you just say the word. You don't inflect it. You don't interpret it. You just say it, and you think about it. And then you take a little tiny pause, and then it's a flat reading. And it sounds like it's boring, but it's not. And when you get professional actors that have done things, I did it with Long Day's Journey, and it took us, I guess, eight hours to read the play. Uh, <laughs> And uh, but wow. the guy, Bill Patterson, who had done the play before, uh, he was ready to go on stage without any rehearsal. You know, he already knew how to mm. do it. So mm -hmm. this reading uh, gave him a whole new insight into the meaning of the text. And uh, it's a great method if you have time to do it. The actors will resist it at first, but then they realize that what they're hearing is uh, uh, the inner life of that word. and. Uh, you know, you're saying to be or not. Well, you can't help but interpret it, right? <laughs> but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but uh, you do it slow like that, and then you get this sense of making a connection. You know, in acting, you're talking about communion or contact or, um, you know, uh, how you make contact with your fellow actor. Well, you have to make contact with the word and give it time to get into your consciousness as a meaning. And so where some words don't have much meaning, like the, uh, but some words have a lot of it, like love. And how many ways can you say that, you know? Right. Uh, so you don't choose to say any of them. You just think about it for a second. And um, it's a great technique for uh, understanding. And then I found it in Stanislavski. He called it diction, the soul of the word you know uh, hmm. he had a, a lot of insight into the technical theater 
So that's what I did. Uh, worked through all that stuff. Before, made a prompt script out of that, those discoveries, and marked it all up and wrote it all down. And then I'd start rehearsals. And I started rehearsals with blocking. I mean, we read it three or four times in different ways, slow and fast. And uh, then we started blocking. I didn't it, let them block the play. I blocked it because I knew what it meant. And I knew what it, uh, where the intentions were and where the transitions were. So mm -hmm. I, I blocked the play very tight uh, right at the beginning. And then I would repeat the blocking after I'd done it once. And then I'd work, work rehearsals where you take a, a, a couple of pages and uh, do those three or four times with notes and repeat them. And uh, working rehearsals were to discover, I think it was Rilke said that about Ibsen. He sat at the window discerning transitions. That's the real uh, discovery time is uh, how you get from point A to point B. And that's a transition. And you make it clear. The great actors all could just make those changes uh, so clear. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. And uh, there were, the better the actor, the more transitions there were. Uh, and the more clarity there was in what they each meant and how they reflected the intentions or the objectives of the character, what he wanted at that moment in time. So it's all a study thing, I think. Uh, and then, of course, you have to eventually release it all and let it play, you know, sure. let them uh, let them play it uh, in whatever way they want. But the structure is already there. So they're playing them what they want, but they're also playing what you want. Uh, Right. Which is a, a meeting of the two skills um, of acting and directing. They should yeah. be the same. Well, you mentioned your time working with uh, Renoir uh, at, at UC Berkeley, and I know you were there for many, many years uh, leading to the, the department. And you said earlier that you yeah. had the decision or, or it was the decision to combine both, you know, the study of literature and the study of acting together. I was curious, you know, with, with all your years there, what are a couple of the things that you were most proud of that you were able to uh, accomplish in terms of the, the training of young professionals uh, through that program? Well, I always felt that the students at Berkeley and Columbia were both uh, extraordinarily uh, gifted they, because I guess they didn't have giant egos to impose mm -hmm. on a pro on the process like the professionals would already know what they wanted to do uh, and they knew how to do it but the students didn't know either and they were willing to be entirely open to the text so the productions of Shakespeare were unusually vivid and um, truthful I think um, and we did many many great plays um, uh, and those were things like the experience of being in King Lear or um, Ghosts or the Birds in the Greek theater or whatever were um, characterized by rather selfless performances. And I think they had a sense of being in touch with uh, the creator who is, a you know, being in, like being a musician, being in touch with Mozart is very a deepening experience for a player of the piano um, and for an actor to be in touch with um, the classic writers, Shakespeare and uh, all of the, you know, there's not a lot of them, as a matter of fact, uh, that are old, but still alive. Uh, and um, that uh, process was very enriching for students. I think it was uh, not me so much. It was just uh uh, the relation between that student and uh, William Shakespeare or Jean-Baptiste Poquelin, right, uh, or well, whoever. Uh, they put their self into that other self and they took out of it what was uh, what kept that person alive over all these years. And that's quite astonishing that a playwright stays alive over centuries. Um Doing the birds was just astonishing. That was a play from 400 BC, and it was getting huge laughs in the Greek theater in uh, in the 60s somewhere wow. uh, when we needed a laugh. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. um, I think it was a, a humanistic experience in the best sense of the word. It, they, they didn't uh, graduate like a graduate of Carnegie Tech. Uh, 
knowing six dialects and having a voice that's trained for four years under an astonishing teacher like Ada Skinner. Mm -hmm. Uh, So uh, the conservatories had uh, their thing, and we had a more open humanistic experience with the players. Well, you bring up a point that, you know, I want to kind of highlight again that it sounds like to continue, you know, being a, a great actor, you know, even as you, you know, become a professional or years down the road as a professional, uh, you know, if you can still be open to new ideas and new things and oh, yeah. new new methods, new approaches uh, and be, you know, really willing to give yourself over to the text and, and to you know, of course, bring your training, but leave maybe any preconceived notions or ideas uh, and just be willing to explore. Right. Well, one of our graduates was Stacy Keats, and he did very well. Sure. He, he oh, yeah. A, he, he was a wonderful actor when he got there, though we didn't necessarily teach him how to act because his father was an actor and he came a very skillful actor. I mean, he took all the classes and he played all the leading roles and uh, he went on to become a very distinguished professional. So it wasn't us that made him into a professional. Although we had our own little, uh, little bit of impetus or help. He's uh, of always course. been very confident. Yeah. Uh, and then the workshop was another major experience of mine because I worked for them and they were um, an astonishing group of Herbert Blau and Jules Irving in uh, San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And they ended up in uh, Lincoln Center much to their uh, disaster. Um, But I did some famous plays with them and also with the early ACT. I I had a wonderful actor in those days named Michael O'Sullivan. He was an eccentric character actor for the workshop. He played King Lear when he was 27, I think. Oh, wow. uh, He was an astonishing actor. And uh, we did a play called The Architect and Emperor of Assyria, by a Spanish dwarf named Arabal in the early ACT days in which um, one of the actors eats the other, eats the other one. Uh, and uh, one of them sings an aria, which I can't even say on the telephone what it was about. <laughs> but it was so scandalous that 70 people got up at once and left the theater. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, they came thinking that the play was going to be about uh, downtown San Francisco architects. And it was about this fantasy duo on an island, uh, one of whom was an architect and one of them was an emperor. Hmm. Uh, It was a very scandalous play. And uh, ACT decided to let me do it. And again, I chose it because it was, again, an intensely alive kind of event, uh, even if it was a a scandalous and uh, frightfully uh, shocking kind of language Mm -hmm. Arabelle used in the play. But it was so astonishing as an invention for the theater. And uh, Michael was, I think, the greatest uh, actor I've known in personal terms. Uh, Mm. And he worked for both the workshop and ACT. And he taught uh, the sonnets in the conservatory. Oh, okay. He he died from drugs. Mm. Uh, Drugs were a scourge, still are, huh? Yeah. Absolutely. But uh, he was he was a phenomenally gifted uh, man. And he was he put out so intensely he would in rehearsals, he would be playing this scene with extraordinary intensity. And all of a sudden he'd have to go in the bathroom and throw up and then he'd come back out and go right on as if nothing had happened. I mean, he he was an intense um, experience to be around him. Um, And to watch him, how much he put into things. Uh, I've never known anyone uh, like Jerry Page was like that, too, I guess. So. Sure, sure. But not too many people do that. Um, thank goodness we couldn't survive. Well, yeah, it's it, it's hard to burn that bright uh, no, too for bright, so long. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you know, Robert, it, it, it was it really interesting as I was you know going through your career that you almost you almost sound like a modern actor, like somebody working today, because you did so many different things between acting and directing and teaching and translating. Yeah. And I, I'm just curious, was it a matter of necessity or right place, right time? Or, or was it a creative desire that led you to pursue so many different things? 
Well, I think it was mostly that I had the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, I didn't uh, invent these things. The, uh, sure. I was asked to do them. And um, uh, so it was probably a, a fusion of the fact I was interested in both the text and the performance. Uh, I was uh, trained as a reader as well as a performer. So I was looking for things that had those values in it. And then I had a lifelong uh, interest in uh, some of the great writers like Moliere and Shakespeare and Chekhov that I sought to do and tried to find ways to make sure I got to do some of them. And the publishing just came because uh, I think it was Herb Blau who read my book and um, referred my book to this press in London and uh, talked very strongly about it. So they did it. They read it and and wanted to do it. And so I went through their editing process. And and, uh, it has a lot of what we've been talking about in it. Uh, Sure. And as someone who, you know, grew up appreciating and studying great literature, was that maybe in the back of your mind that you wanted to write a book at some point? Well, I'm sure it was. I mean, people kept saying I ought to do it because there wasn't that much stuff on Moliere uh, in English. And um, since I had done 11 of the plays, I felt I, I felt the obligation to share what I learned and uh, and. Uh, one way to share it was to write it down. Sure. So I started doing that, and then I got this publisher. It it took me seven years, so it took a while. Holy cow! Yeah, that's a that's a long time to be working on anything. Yeah. And and I I've heard that a lot of people writing books, um, you know, you go through different phases, and one of them is you know you're excited, and then you get to the phase where you just hate everything you've written, and nothing. <laughs> And nothing works and nothing sounds good. Uh, and then eventually you get yeah. through that and, and you publish it. Um, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, I mean, I mean, it's a, it's a, I, I've also heard that it can be a real like personal development journey because you have to wrestle with yourself and how you're communicating this, uh, you know, right. these, these ideas. And you have to take criticism. Yes. <laughs> I mean, Eric Bentley made some devastating, uh, remarks about it, but I changed the structure of the book and, uh, a guy at UC Press read it carefully, and he had some wonderful suggestions. So I was able to work those uh, those kind of sensibilities into the book, and uh, they helped. Right. Uh, yeah. So, well, but I'm not a I'm not a that is not my main uh, life experience is writing. Sure. It's only directing. Uh, right. Uh, some 130 plays. Yeah. Well, quite quite a few. Um, and a, and, I, and I know and I know you worked with uh, your wife Angie uh, a number of times and I and I'm I'm very curious you know you guys were together for so long and worked together so many times you know what did what do you feel like Angie taught you over the years about working with actors that it's a complete mystery <laughs> I mean uh, she she would say. Um, like a famous story about the actor who was given a direction to open the door. And he said, I can open the door a hundred ways. Which way do you want? And, uh, Anzi would get some kind of simple direction and then she would transform it. Michael Chekhov said the essence of acting is transformation. And Anzi just totally changed second to second on stage. And I never knew how she did it. Hmm. I couldn't tell you to this day what techniques she used or what methods she used. She just did the magic if, and, um, you know, and she just uh, did it. Uh, She imagined that she was somebody else doing this thing uh, or saying this word, and that would change her entire behavior. In life, she was a very modest, simple, uh, retiring uh, woman. On stage, she was a monster. She could play the most outrageous uh, characters uh, and, um, you know, inerato characters crawling around the stage, killing cockroaches. Um, right. And uh, I mean, she was astonishing. And I don't know how she did that. I, I never could uh, ascribe it to any 
thing, except she just had this extraordinary imagination uh, and she listened to it and she could do almost anything. And she had an extremely well-trained voice um, mm. and her speech was immaculate. I mean, you could understand every word she said. Right. Uh, she had four years of training at by Edith Skinner at Carnegie Tech. So she knew the difference between a long and a short vowel and how to pronounce consonants. And, but her genius was this, uh, imagination. I think, uh, so, you know, the old thing, let's play, let's pretend that's right. what she did. She just said, let's pretend I'm Lady Macbeth and boom, there it was. Well, so, so how did that inform how you uh, communicated or worked with other, other actors over the years? Oh, well, I was more of a coach uh, to other actors. I mean, I, I had studied the text for a pattern of intentions and, uh, you know, uh, what the character meant and what the beginning and ending of the character was and all that's everything to do with it. So I knew going into rehearsals where the transitions were, I thought. And then so I would... Um, coach the actors to make those transitions with Angie. She already knew them. Um, she just did them right from the beginning. I mean, um, she kept enriching it and changing it, but it was, um, not because of my coaching. Most actors needed, you know, real help, um, because they didn't have time to study. Um, mm -hmm. they, they were busy doing all kinds of things, but, uh, so I helped them, but Angie always knew how to do it. So did Stacy. Stacy Keats just knew what mm -hmm. to do, and, hmm. uh, he, and he could do it right from the beginning. Uh, it's a gift. It's it, it's an amazing, uh, you know, uh, Auerbach's phrase about uh, the basis of theater is imitation, and then Michael Chekhov says it's transformation. Those are both operative words, um, and uh, she could do them without being coached. Uh, Although she took direction always perfectly, and then she transformed it into herself. <laughs> yeah, she was astonishing. Yeah, I, I I feel fortunate that in addition to you know uh, some of her TV and film work that I've seen, that I was I was lucky enough to see her on stage a little bit here and there. But uh, yeah, I would have loved to have seen you know her heyday uh, of just doing all the all the roles that you've been mentioning. I have a picture of her as Elizabeth in my room here. Was oh, painting really? Ariel Elizabeth Dead, which was a play written by a New Yorker writer, and we did it in Berkeley. And we also did it at Stages in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and that was Elizabeth sitting in a chair dying. She did that, uh, Elizabeth the first, for four days. She sat in a chair until she died, and she never would let them lie her down. And uh, Tro tried to imagine what was going through her mind those four days and of course a lot of it was um uh, mary that she had killed so it was an astonishing opaque thick play uh not mm -hmm. not a, a a great play but a very dense uh poem about elizabeth and um uh, she did that in both places and i have her picture up here doesn't look like her uh, <laughs> there's a white face and a strawberry wig well, I'm curious, you know, you guys had such a uh, creative and artistic partnership for over 60 years. And I I'm just curious, uh, you know, how you uh, how you kept that together, how you know, what what kind of um, secrets or insights uh, were there to, you know, keeping, you know, keeping that kind of partnership so strong over all those years? Well, I don't think there's any secrets. We didn't work together uh, all the time. As a matter of fact, probably most of her work uh, was uh, away from me in film and television. And uh, in the last 10 years of her life, uh, she did mostly film and television and Antius stuff. But uh, we did one project at Antius. We did John Gabriel Borkman as a sort of a study for a year. And, uh, but we didn't always do things together. And, uh, Prior, prior to that, uh, at ACT, we did Long Day's Journey together, uh, and that was probably the highlight of my work there, uh, was mm -hmm. I toured that play um, 
And talk about that. It was a ground plan uh, was based on visiting the O'Neill house. Okay. Where he lived, uh, I forget, in New London or somewhere up there in New England. And uh, I knocked on the door and the lady answered the door and I had two little children with me. And I said, I'd like to see the house. I'm going to direct the play. And so I went in the house and the living room uh, was all covered with dust jackets. And you obviously couldn't sit down in there. And the other room was the kitchen in which there was servants and you couldn't go in there. And then there was an addition to the house sticking out the side uh, where where the men sat around the table and uh, argued and yelled at each other. And that's what the play is about, right? Yeah. So the ground plan, I took that idea and uh, made a platform stage without any furniture in it except a table and chairs. And then upstage, there was a realistic wall. And behind the wall, it was a full realistic set. Wow. So the play took place on a barren, blank, empty stage, and the background was realistic. And so the ground plan reflected how the play was born, you know, in life. And uh, that was one of the more fun things I ever had to do. And and Angie played. I toured the play with another actress around the nine campuses. And um, since I had developed this ground plan idea, it was perfect for touring because all I needed was a table and four chairs. And um, then I came, brought it back to San Francisco. And uh, Angie had been in another uncut version of the play. And she joined my cast and the Geary. And we played that play for a while at the Geary with the, my cast plus Angie as Mary. And that was one of the most astonishing uh, times of our collaboration because she moved into my play and learned the blocking in one day and um, went on stage. It was astonishing. Cause she knew that she knew who she was and um, she just brought it to uh, a different staging. I, I think the thing was we had a uh, very close friendship and love for each other. And uh, uh, we survived all those years. We had a few traumas um but of course we always came back together uh, so it sounds like there's there's a little bit of uh a key to not always working together might might be a little bit of a a good yeah, idea that's for fine <laughs> too because we always shared the work right if one of us was in the audience <laughs> yeah yeah but we were very close friends uh, for all those years and yeah we needed I each other imagine. a lot and we had wonderful children so yeah they're still with me Yes, uh, I've only known Matt in person, but uh, yeah, he's he's real uh, wonderful guy. Yeah, my other son is a pediatric oncologist. He takes care of children with cancer. Oh, and, wow! Uh, my yeah. daughter is now in Spain, and she's a chemist. Uh, wow. She's at a factory in Spain, checking what their safety is. So she, they were all very, very successful, but yes. they all left the theater. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, uh, I just had a couple other questions, Robert. Um, yeah. A lot of people in theater or, or creative pursuits, you know, there can be a lot of anxiety uh, about what they should be doing or um, what they are you know, worrying about or, or things like that. And I'm just curious if anything comes to mind, you know, if I ask if, if there's anything you wish you paid more attention to or if there's anything you really wish you paid less attention to over the years that didn't really matter as much as you thought, does anything come to mind uh, with those ideas? No, I was uh, always blissfully happy at whatever I was doing. And um, I never had any second thoughts about doing something else. And, uh, and yet when it was over, uh, you know, when a play's over, it's over and uh, it's gone. And, um, it, uh, like life, you just, it's over. And, um, and then there's nothing unless you happen to be someone who has created something that has in it the ability to stay alive. And I don't think directing is that kind of art. I think directing is interpretive, not creative in the primary okay. sense. So mm-hmm. I, did, I always was very uh, content to do that. And I never had any uh, yearnings to be a playwright or to be on Broadway or uh, I knew enough about Broadway and I knew enough about film to know that that wasn't 
where I belonged. Um, I didn't have the temperament for that, and I didn't have the temperament for film. Uh, so I was always very happy to do what I was doing, and either teaching literature or acting uh, or directing plays for students or professionals. Uh, it's what I did all my life, those four things, and uh, I liked it. I loved doing it all, and I didn't have any second thoughts, no. Well, I mean, that's great to hear. And it does sound like, uh, you know, you were certainly able to live vicariously through through Angie, you know, for any interest you might have had oh, yeah. in what, what actors, you know, did or how, how you know, what their life was. Um, yeah. Now, I was also curious, uh, you know, with, with someone who has such a, a strong background in literature, are there any quotes that you think of often or that you live your life by? Yes. It must be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of my favorite lines is in Cherry Orchard. It's the silly little guy who um, wakes up every morning and finds a spider on his chest uh, or comes through a doorway and trips and falls on his face. His name is Epi Hodoff. And every time he has a calamity like this, he says, Ock, life. <laughs> and that has always stuck in my mind as the, not only the essence of Chekhov, who's able to create these extraordinary characters out of almost nothing. Uh, you know, you don't know how he does it. I mean, you know, I directed his plays and I don't know how he did what he did. Uh, but uh, Ock Life is a, a very complex little statement because it's a complaint against life. It's also using the German language, which is a terrible thing to do in Russia. So he's doing the using the wrong language to say his complaint against life being against him. Uh, mm. I was, and he was a very funny, wonderful character. I think about that. I knew Hamlet very well. I studied that a lot for a year um, at Columbia, and then I did the uh, the play, and I did uh, studied it in Paris in the Bibliothèque Nationale, and. Uh, there's an awful lot of stuff in there that comes to my mind every once in a while. Moliere, of course, I'm, I, I always hear certain uh, lines of his. Uh, the scene in, in the beginning of The Misanthrope when they're talking about how, uh, why does he, he love silly men? He says, I don't know why. A reason is not what governs love. La raison n'est pas ce qui règle l'amour. That sticks in my head. Uh, a lot. It's a, a wonderful and true observation about the relation between reason and emotion. Of course. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. One of the smartest guys I ever knew is emotionally blind. Uh, so, you know, um, those are some of the things in the whole uh, thing of Hamlet struggling with uh, being alive or not. Uh, as you get closer to death, that comes back to your head a lot. Um, mm. What 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 is that, and what is it all about, and how can there be nothing after so much life? Uh, but there is, and it's everything. So uh, you know, every age has its uh, joys and sorrows. So old age is the same as all the rest of them. You have some right. joys and some sorrows, right? Right. Well, this has been a really fun conversation. I really appreciate uh, just, you know, getting to know your journey a bit more and, and just, yeah, I've had a lot of fun with the chat, Robert. So well, so it much. certainly is unique for me. I've never done this in 91 years, so uh, you're a first. All right. Then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, you have a great day with the dog, and yeah, uh, I you. hope you keep being the youngest person in the room with the 200 folks you go to dinner with. Okay. No, you can find the damnedest things. You'll sit with some little old lady uh, who's almost mute, and then it finally turns out she spent 40 years in Japan and uh, uh, had all kinds of fascinating experiences uh, uh, in going back and forth from Japan to the United States. And she, you wow. wouldn't have guessed that in a million years. Of course. And another lady taught mathematics in Oakland Technical High School for 40 years and loved it. Wow. How can you imagine doing such a thing? Um, <laughs> you know, te teach a bunch of kids that don't want to go to school math, and yet she found it absolutely uh, sensational. That's so, you great. know, you're always surprised by uh, what you discover behind the 
cliche. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, that's why these uh, conversations are so great because there's yeah. there's so much behind each person. So again, thanks so much for your time, Robert. Okay. Bye bye. Hey guys, Nathan here one more time. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe so you don't miss anything ahead. Be sure to visit workingactorsjourney.com for additional info and links for items mentioned in today's episode, as well as all the episodes. You can follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. All the links are on our site and in the episode notes. Become a premium member and enjoy additional benefits and perks of the show starting at just $2 per month. Head over to workingactorsjourney.com slash premium to join the Working Actors community. And don't forget to claim your free audiobook at workingactorsjourney.com slash audible. Thanks again to today's guest and to everyone that makes these episodes possible. And a special thanks to you for listening. I'm Nathan Agan, and enjoy the journey.